presumably. And we're recording. So let's do our introductions. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is episode 11 of our virtual star party. And you might be saying, where the heck is Derek? And I got a weird echo going on here. Man, never a dull moment here. Let me just mute that. All right. But yeah, anyway, I'm Frank Kane, and I'm uh, filling in for uh, Derek Demeter this week. Uh, Derek was in sickbay earlier this week, so uh, he's taken some much-needed R&R this weekend. Uh, but he left the con with uh, me and Justin here, so welcome. I guess we can give ourselves a field promotion now. Uh, so uh, Absolutely, yeah. We're, we're due, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, so I'm going to make myself science officer, and uh, you're, you're usually the communications officer. What do you want to be this week? I'll, I'm just going to jump right to Admiral. I mean, why not, right? Why not? Yeah. Yeah. What, the boss is away, you know, the, 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 the mice will play. <laughs> totally, totally. Is that the phrase? Yeah, he, does, he has no idea what he's in for when he gets back. So he took over the whole place. And we have a special guest uh, this week as well. So please welcome NASA Solar System Ambassador Sharifa Gassel. Thank you. And I'll be the Solar System Ambassador, so I represent the whole, the whole solar system. Wow. That's, I think you like outrank us all at that point. Very cool. You can also be ship's counselor. I mean, you got the credentials for that too. That works. You can do both. Totally. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so uh, we wanted to show you guys um, some globular clusters with the telescope tonight, but sadly it clouded up and uh, no dice for that. But however, we do have some uh, cool pictures of globular clusters we can show you. So we'll spend some time talking about that. And then we'll talk about some uh, fun stuff from NASA. And uh, if we have time at, at the end, we will show some uh, previously recorded footage of uh, Scopey McScope face looking at some galaxies, if time permits. We'll see. We'll see how, how this goes. But yeah, the uh, topic for tonight is globular clusters. And uh, these are kind of one of my favorite objects in the galaxy or the universe for that matter. They're like these mysterious things. Like here's a, here's a picture I took of M13, which is one of the more famous globular clusters out there. And uh, let's see if I can pin that here. Yeah, so like these are just like these collections of hundreds of thousands of stars that are just like clustered together in these balls of starness. I mean, for lack of a better word. And there's like about a hundred of these around our galaxy, right? Um, yeah, but uh, I think 150 is the current count. So, and and actually, that's actually a small number compared. Remember some of the galaxies that we were looking at during the Smithsonian Star Party that had you know, multiple thousands of, of globular clusters in them. Can you imagine looking up at the night sky and almost everywhere you look, you see one versus, you know, the, the few that we see here. I know it's crazy. And uh, they're just really cool objects because they're so mysterious, you know, like one thing that I don't get is like how they're distributed around the galaxy. So I've got this uh, neat little video that came out of NASA here. Let me put that on the full screen here. And those little like pinkish blobby things, those are globular clusters around, you know, our Milky Way here. And what's weird is that they're not in with the rest of the galaxy. They're like kind of like scattered around in like this sphere surrounding the galaxy. So how these things formed is like really kind of mysterious. There's a lot of different theories about it, but um, you know, I don't really have a good explanation myself. And, and uh, some of these might even have different origins, right? Um, for example, yeah. Yeah, like Omega Centauri. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, Omega Centauri. I mean, well, we don't ever get to see it, unfortunately. I mean, that's a bummer. But this is the largest you know, globular cluster that's been ever discovered in the Milky Way. It's in the southern hemisphere, though. So, uh, you know, we, we can uh, see images of it, of course, but unless you're uh, you know, down in that area. But this, this sucker is huge. And, and these are some of the oldest objects in the universe. These were some of the first objects to form, you know, after the universe itself. And, and we know this because of the age of the stars in these globular clusters. These are very, very old stars. And you notice this, this uh, darker color, these oranges, these reds. As stars age, they can expand and then uh, they turn this uh, incredibly deep red color. And, and we also know that it, we're dealing with very, very old areas of our universe because there's a, a, a huge lack of heavy elements in these clusters. And mm -hmm. where do heavy, heavy elements come from? Well, they come from uh, exploded stars and none of these stars have exploded. They have remained in this state since some of the early portions of our, of our uh, early universe. So just, just amazing to be able to see these and know that you're looking back so far into time 
they are fantastic to look at. Uh, Sharifa, do you ever take a look at these with your telescope? Yeah, it's it's been uh, interesting to try and learn how to find them on my telescope. And uh, since I have the Dobsonian kind of pointing in the right areas, I'm trying to find them. And, and so, yeah, I mean, but even learning about how many, the, the, if you were to go into uh, one of these globular clusters and stand there and look at the night sky, it would be like reading in daylight if you were standing on those stars. It's just so bright, um, just the amount of it. So it, after this, I want to look at more of them, <laughs> you know, and, and make them a bigger effort to really to learn more about them. But I think John was asking how old are they? And I'm curious about that also. Yeah, they vary. But, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, you don't really know. But you know, a lot of them are around like 10 billion years, I think, right? That sound about right, Justin? Uh, that seems yes. like the general range. And um, yeah, there's, we're learning a lot about them still, you know, like I keep seeing new research and new articles that like pin their dates to be a little bit older or, or a little bit younger. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're really old stars and really old objects. Um, but there's some very confusing things about them. Like uh, there are, you know, a few blue uh, stars in some of these globular clusters too. And generally speaking, ancient stars, like the ones we're talking about are red because red, red dwarfs pretty much last forever, right? Uh, but it turns out that there are some things they call blue stragglers, I think it is. And like when some of these stars get so close that they actually merge and, and do funky things, like it can basically form a new star. So even though there's not a whole lot of like new star formation happening in these globular clusters, uh, sometimes, you know, nature finds a way. <laughs> and uh, we end up with these like blue stragglers within them as well. Um, but they're just like really mysterious objects. Uh, they're cool to look at because they tend to punch through light pollution really nicely. So even if there's a, a moon out or you're in suburbia, uh, they still make for really good targets. Uh, they're, they're really easy to photograph as well. You know, it doesn't take a whole lot of time. Um, but they're just fascinating in their own right. The reason I brought up uh, Omega Centauri, Justin, is because they think that one might actually be the core of a captured galaxy that uh, the Milky Way just kind of hoovered up at some point in, in the past. So... <laughs> who knows like how many other globular clusters might have sort of this interesting backstory to them as opposed to just being, you know, formed out of the same cloud of material when the galaxy was forming. Uh, they're, they're fascinating, beautiful objects and uh, we're still learning a lot about them. Yeah, they, they are really neat. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're getting into astronomy as a beginner, uh, they're, they're fun to look at at all levels of astronomy. But if you're a beginner, one of the best things to do, in my opinion, is you know, find a dark sky, grab a chair, grab a pair of binoculars, and, you know, we've got all these cool tools now. We've got these apps that you can, you know, take, take your, uh, your phone app and point it up at the sky, uh, an app like Sky Guide, and, and you can scan the sky and find these objects. You can type them into the app, and it'll tell you where to look. Um, or you can just go old-fashioned grab your binoculars in your chair and just scan the sky, you know, and your, your, your eyes are going to pick these up. They are that bright. And um, Ophiuchus has what something like 20, just in one constellation of the night sky has 20 globular clusters in just one, you know, small area of the sky. So just focusing on Ophiuchus alone, you're going to have some fun finding these objects, but get yourself a pair of binoculars. If you, you know, have a, a, a pair laying around, that's fine too. If you're shopping for binoculars, you're not sure what to get, you're wondering what those weird numbers on the binoculars mean, uh, that first number uh, might be a seven, might be a 10, that's your magnification. And so the higher that number is the more magnification you're gonna get. So, you know, with whatever's in your price range, you wanna go with that higher number. And then that second number is the millimeter of the lens. And that is going to determine your field of view, how much of the sky you're gonna be able to see in those binoculars. The bigger that number, the more of the sky you're gonna be able to see. So I've got a pair that are, I, I, I've got them at, uh, oh gosh, what's that? Uh, uh, place around town that's got um, uh, uh, all, all sorts of, it's not Home Depot, but it's one of like an Ace Hardware or something like that. I found these 10 by 50s, so 10 magnification, uh, 50 millimeter lens, so a nice big open portion of the sky for $20. I've got my gravity chair, I can sit back. When we have star parties, a lot of times I'm not even looking through the telescope, I'm just sitting in my gravity chair, scanning the sky for these globular clusters. And they're just fantastic to look at. And while we're talking about globulars, we should talk about open clusters too. 
there's a pretty famous one that everyone's always looking at, right? What's that one? The Pleiades. Pleiades, yes. Woo-hoo! Sharifa, Pleiades, I mean, with your daub, that has got to be you probably, a, you know, you're probably looking at like a 32 millimeter eyepiece, but I mean, can you get all the Pleiades in, in your daub? It depends. Usually I use like a, I don't have a, it's like, I think a 28 is what I usually use. And yeah, I mean, it's incredible. Super crisp. I mean, you see everything and you can zoom in or whatever. But yeah, the Pleiades is always, is always neat. I'm going to have to take your advice and, and get those binoculars to run them down. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it's, it is, uh, it's night and day. I and mean, you're able to show people this, but you have, you have globular clusters where you've got a, an incredible amount of gravity pulling together thousands of stars. And I'm going to show you a couple of pictures that we have in Space Engine. Uh, because uh, Space Engine gives you a really cool view that you don't normally get to see, even when you're looking at them uh, uh, with a telescope or with binoculars. Um, but open clusters, well, these are younger stars and the color changes, right? You go from this red, uh, deep red, deep orange colored stars to these younger, hot burning blue stars. Uh, Frank, you want to talk about the Pleiades a little bit? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, it's obviously hard to miss. Um, not up this time of year right now, is it? Like it's uh, we have more of a, it. yeah, that yeah, window more of a winter is closed for now. Yeah. yeah but we'll get our see. audience ready for the fall. But my favorite thing about the Pleiades actually as a photographer and just as, as visual observer as well is that it's what's uh, in, it's inside what's called the Merope Nebula. So there's like this blue sort of cloudy tinge around them too. And on a really clear night, you can see that visually. Um, oh, hey, we got Space Engine coming up. Yeah, and through a I and through a long exposure for I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, please do. So uh, let's uh, let's go explore some of these in 3D. Yeah. So let's pull up uh, NGC 5986 first, and um, this just kind of gives you an idea of a globular cluster, and we're seeing it in this wonderful kind of three dimension. Um, you know, even with our, our telescopes or our binoculars, we really are only kind of almost seeing it in a two dimension. And Space Engine uh, does this incredible job of rendering it in such a way that you can really get a view of what it, this would be like flying around this thing uh, in space. And can, are, can you guys pick out the blue stars in here? You've got this high concentration of these older red stars, but then you've got these high mass blue stars. And, and these are stars that have collided and this is pretty rare in the universe. I mean, it's not that common for you know stars to be colliding like this and forming a higher mass star. So you can kind of pick out those blue stars. Uh, you can see how densely um, you know connected they are together. You know, on on average, stars are somewhere between maybe five and ten light years um, away from each other. But in a globular cluster, you're you're talking about stars that are less than a light year. Apart. Art. So, I mean, Sharifa, Frank, I'm, what would it be like to be on a planet? There's no planets in globular clusters, right? No heavy elements really form to create planets. But if you were, what would your sky look like? Daytime, based on that. <laughs> it would be nice. Imagine like having the entire night sky just completely lit up with stars. I mean, it would be completely, you know, poking holes in the, in the sky and you just have light everywhere. I mean, that's what well, I, you, I think you said it yourself is that you, you could probably, you know, read to the night sky. It would be so bright. <laughs> and it'd be a lot easier to get to the next star too, you know, like uh, <laughs> within our neck of the woods here, like it would take hundreds of years, like even at the fastest possible speeds to like reach the nearest uh, stellar system. But inside a globular cluster, they're, they're all just next door neighbors. It's kind of a shame yeah. that there's no heavy metals in there, you know, like, um, there's uh, probably not a whole lot in there other than stars and gas, but um, it's a place that stirs the imagination for sure. Oh yeah, and even if there were heavy elements and even if planets were to form, imagine the gravity uh, battles that would be happening here with stars that close together. You, you really couldn't have a, a solar system like we have today. I mean, planets would be getting thrown all over the place, right. yanked by the gravity of all these stars so close together. Yeah, it must be a very dynamic place. But uh, from our standpoint, they're just pretty to look at and uh, nice to think about. So, yeah, cool. 
Awesome. Absolutely. Well, one, one other thing I want to do is I'm going to stop sharing Space Engine real quick. I'm going to pull up uh, Stellarium because Stellarium is a great uh, program that any of you can download for free. It's a, you can go to stellarium.org, download this program, and uh, it's a, just a great way to explore the night sky. And I'm going to take you to the one area of the sky that we were talking about earlier uh, Ophiuchus to see some of these stars, uh, see where you can find a lot of these globular clusters because, you know, summer's here. Uh, it's a nice time of year to look at the night sky, you know, put on some bug spray, grab your, your red uh, headlamp and uh, your, your chair and your binoculars or even, you know, you don't need a, a high powered telescope to find uh, globular clusters. It's not like, um, uh, you know, the, the, the high power telescope that Frank's got that's looking at super deep space objects. These are all, you know, relatively close. They're in our galaxy. And even with a, a, a small powered telescope, you can, you can find these objects. So let's, let's go to, um, oh, I've already got it set to uh, about 1030 right now. And we're going to go, and we'll start with, let's start with M10. That was on my list tonight. <laughs> oh, good, good. Yeah. And I'm going to turn on so we can kind of see the night sky here, what we're talking about. And let me back out a little bit further. Well, that's a little too far. I'll close that, get that out of the way. So we are looking at the eastern, southeastern sky. And um, you can see a very bright star right now in the eastern sky called Vega. And I don't know if you guys can see my cursor here, but Vega yeah, is one of the brightest stars in the night sky. It's absolutely beautiful to look at through a telescope. It looks like this beautiful shining diamond of a, of a star. But if you go just to the right of that, you're going to reach a constellation called Ophiuchus. And um, I'm going to zoom in right to the center of Ophiuchus and show you M10. And again, this is just one of 20 globular clusters that you can find in uh, just this one piece of the sky alone. So look at that. I mean, this is, of course, uh, not an actual um, uh, astrophotography picture, but it's uh, uh, an idea of what you're going to be looking for. And your eye's going to pick up on these wonderful concentrations of light uh, inside of, of the uh, constellation as you scan it with either your telescope or with your binoculars. Beautiful. Yeah, and this is a great time of year to be looking for globular clusters, too. I mean, like tonight, that's pretty much the main thing that's out there invisible. You know, uh, the galaxies have kind of started to set. The Milky Way doesn't rise until the early morning. Uh, it's all about globular clusters right now. So if you do find yourself with a clear night, uh, this is what you want to be aiming for. Yeah, it, it's, it's, so, it's so relaxing, so nice to be able to just go out and, and scan for these objects. And again, you're looking at some of the oldest objects in the universe so just kind of kind of absorb that alone is just uh, absolutely fantastic so and then in the fall make sure uh, open clusters or loose clusters are uh, very cool to look at also and again these are younger uh, 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 systems um, and, and the Pleiades is a fantastic beginner uh, object yeah. to, to look at hey you know what else is out tonight uh, m5 could you punch that in real quick Justin oh sure yeah, over in Serpens. That's actually one of my favorites. So we're just heading to a constellation just kind of north um, west of Ophiuchus called Serpens. And if you kind of, right between Serpens and um, there's a bright star uh, called Spica here to the right. You can kind of see Spica there. So uh, if you were going to be looking for your um, kind of an idea, if you didn't have a go-to telescope that had the punch in in the computer, you were going traditional. You've got Vega here at the upper left. You've got Arcturus up here at the right. You've got Spica down here to the right. So you can kind of see where we're looking at here. M5, the rose cluster. Let's zoom in there. Take a look at this beauty. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a uh, photo of that too that I can show you guys when we're done here. It's just a beautiful oh, yeah. cluster and uh, it's got a really nice bright star right next to it that makes for really nice framing as well. Uh, oh yeah, hey, I can do that right now. Uh, so here we are. Let me pin myself here. Yeah, so this is a picture of M5 I took last year. Um, 
looks uh, similar to what we just saw in Stellarium. Uh, but yeah, I just love that kind of like, you know, really bright star up there in the upper left-hand corner there. Uh, this was actually our Christmas card last year because <laughs> it just looks oh, so no cool. no kidding. What yeah. a cool idea. Yep. Uh, the other cool one that's out right now is uh, M13, which I showed you briefly earlier. And uh, we've, we've talked about that in, a, in a previous shows as well. Uh, but yeah, it's probably worth pointing out where M13 is as well in Hercules, right? Your uh, globular cluster hunting would be not complete without it. <laughs> oh, that is fantastic. I mean, um, you've got to be just loving the fact that you can pull all this uh, uh, parts of our, our galaxy up through your driveway. I mean, uh, we might have a new uh, guest that are watching the show for the first time. Tell them a little bit about how you're getting these images. Uh, yeah, actually, can you see me? I think my image froze up here. You, yeah, you're kind of frozen in this beautiful, um, <laughs> but you can hear like me you're... apparently that's kind yeah, of, yeah, yeah, but that's a good way to freeze. You don't want to freeze like this. Yeah. Yeah, it could be worse. It could be worse, I guess. Um, but yeah, just to give you a, a quick rundown of the, the gear here that was used to take that photo. Basically, it's a uh, eight inch uh, reflector telescope uh, that's on a computerized mount called a Paramount MIT. And I have a, a cooled CCD camera attached to it, which is called an Attic uh, 383L+. And the technique with a globular cluster is you want to take a lot of rather short exposures. So typically, we're going to take like one minute exposures and like take maybe uh, 60 through each filter, stack them all up together. And that way you don't end up overexposing and blowing out those cores of the clusters. Um, and that's how you get a, that's the secret for getting a picture like that. And um, yeah, this might be a good time to shift gears, Justin, while I try to figure out what happened to my camera here. <laughs> Talk among yourselves Absolutely. while I figure this out. <laughs> All right. Well, we have a, an, an awesome guest tonight. So uh, many of you know that we are all part of the Central Florida Astronomical Society. And this is a group of just awesome people that get together here in Central Florida. Well, I mean, we have people coming from all over the state, actually. But um, we get together once a month, uh, have just incredible meetings, guest speakers, and um, it, it's just a lot of like-minded individuals that love the night sky that, um, and love astronomy. We've got star parties, we have outreach events, and uh, so uh, the three of us, and, and Derek, of course, uh, who's obviously normally on the show, are all members of CFIS, and uh, our special guest tonight is Sharifa, and, and she uh, is uh, just an incredible individual with a Jack of all trades, um, and what she's going to talk about tonight is um, a lot of the work that she does as a solar system ambassador. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail and let her do that, but um, she's just a great person and uh, a valuable member of our club. And just thought it would be awesome to have her on to kind of talk about some of the things that she does and ways that you can get more involved if you ever want to get more involved with NASA. It's not that hard. So uh, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Sharifa, and let's, let's go. Sounds good, well, thank you. Um, and thank you for having me on. So yeah, like Justin said, and uh, Frank said that I am a solar system ambassador, which is a NASA JPL uh, joint program. And let's see, and it is located, their headquarters are basically located in California, but they have members um, and volunteers that are all over the country and all over the world, actually, I believe now. And so what I'm going to do is share my screen. Let's see, put together a little, um, let's see, can you see, what can you see? <laughs> my first time co-hosting with Zoom. No worries. Yeah, it looks good. Works. So you see the, the whole thing? Awesome. All mm -hmm. right, so my name is Sharife uh, Gassel, and I have my Master's of Science in Clinical Mental Health Counseling. I'm also a licensed mental health counselor, and I have a private practice in uh, Orlando, and you're in, uh, actually doing telehealth now since COVID. So, But my background is in molecular biology, microbiology, um, psychology, and I also did three years in vet school. And for fun, uh, I'm a rescue diver, a visual artist, and I have done six NASA socials. And as of 2020, I'm a, a solar system ambassador. And this is the kind of thing that solar system ambassadors do. So come and uh, spread the, the love and knowledge of space to uh, as many people as we can. So I also have a blog, blog, social media, uh, called the Blue Marble Project. And I can tell you more about that later. Um, Basically what it is, is learning from space flight 
uh, how to improve health and wellness on earth. So using my, my knowledge as a therapist and my love uh, for psychology and passion for space and putting them together to um, kind of like a spinoff for, yeah. for that. And that's what's awesome. Like you've kind of like found the intersections of all these different uh, threads that you've explored here. Like, you know, um, you've taken like your interest in animals to like have a, a dog Instagram account and like turn that into a NASA social thing. And you've done the intersection of like mental wellness with space with the Blue Marble Project. So it's uh, pretty neat to see how, you know, that's a good strategy in general, I think, you know, just yeah, find your passions and find those intersections and, and go with it, right? Sure. So combining the different things that you love and, um, you know, if there's an opportunity kind of going at it and, and really kind of giving it your all and, and you might be surprised where that leads. So this, anybody is joining from our Instagram account, here's flat newbie. <laughs> <laughs> the real Anubis is, is sleeping somewhere. It's past his bedtime. But so what, why do I mention all this? Because in space, everybody has a place and, uh, and no matter where your background is, oops. So these are the NASA socials I've done and I'll go through them. A um, little bit more detail, just to kind of give you guys an idea as to what what it is that uh, that we do in, in these events and, and how you can participate if you want. So the first one that I did was uh, demo one, and that was back in March second of 2019. It was here at Kennedy Space Center, and uh, I numbered the photos so you can uh, go through them and let's see and see them so the first one this was in the veggie lab and so those are zinnia flowers that were that the seeds were actually planted by scott kelly and uh, in space in the international space station brought back down and then grown into the flowers that you see and so there's a lot of plants currently growing on the international space station and so this is one of the one of the projects that they do and in this lab in in um that picture in picture one and also in picture six they that's a uh, like a space simulated where it's, a, it's an incubator um, kind of like a vacuum chamber where they can simulate deep space and they put plants and different experiments in there to see how plants will react uh, with extreme conditions. So where, where was that? Was that at Kennedy Space Center or somewhere else? Yeah, so that's actually in picture three, um, the International Space Station Processing Facility. So if you go to Kennedy Space Center and the Visitor Center, you know how when you go to the VAB and on the bus tour? Right. Instead of making the left on the on the causeway, you just keep going, and it's all the buildings that are across the way over there. So it's in a in a lab in a building behind more buildings and tucked behind there. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Like I think a lot of people just think that Kennedy Space Center is just about launch support, you know, but there's really a lot of interesting uh, R and D going on there as well, right? Yeah, for sure. So in picture four is actually where the astronaut quarters are, and. Um, they do a lot of the media events there, but the astronaut quarters where you see the, the door where they wave and come out and get into the bus to go to the launch pad, it's in the building where picture four is. And uh, so, yeah, so we went there. And, and also you might recognize picture two as uh, launch pad 39B, which is right across from uh, 39A, which uh, is across over here in the field, which is where all the, the um, recent launches demo two and then also demo one were launched from. So this was actually launch pad 39B was where the space shuttle used to uh, launch from and then they've kind of refurbished it over the years. And then uh, let's see. That demo one was a long night. I mean, I remember, didn't it, wasn't it supposed to go off at midnight and it didn't end up going around until 3 a.m.? About 3 a.m. And so oh, yeah. five was where when we, they took us out into like this, this field and it was, um, yeah, it was incredible, of course. But uh, but you you were out there in the grass with uh, with Jim Bridenstine. You were out there with uh, what was the uh, the vice president there also? I think for that one, yeah, it was all all the beginning stuff, all the press things were were the day before. But for the launch, they bust us out to um, like the Air Force Base side of it, and there was like a causeway that we used to stand out. Now they've changed that around a bit, but you could it was completely pitch black, and you can like see gators and stuff in the water. Um, but of course, so yeah. All right, so next one is Sophia. And um, this was in Palmdale, California at Armstrong Air Force Base. And I participated in this one. This was a few months after, uh, I believe it was March, and it was a behind the scenes look at Sophia. And so uh, you guys might be familiar with what Sophia is and uh, coming back to astronomy. And it stands for the Stratospheric uh, Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. Yeah, and it's a 747 that basically has a giant, uh, what is it? A, 
wrote all the details down, so I wouldn't forget a lot of acronyms. <laughs> so it's a 2.7 meter reflecting telescope that's mounted onto the back of the 747. And um, picture two, you can see the cabin side of the telescope and then the observing side is pointed outside. And so they fly at a ceiling of about 39,000 feet for about 10 hours, more, more or less is their mission. And then they get the infrared images uh, that way. And so picture three is where the astronomers and, and the mission specialists uh, would sit during their the telescope operators where they would sit. Um, and then picture four, of course, is the Super Guppy, which um, was also an airplane that was there. And uh, yeah. Gosh, I, I forgot you were you saw that while you were out there. Like I was like geeking out when I saw that flying over uh, Kennedy Space Center a few months ago. And like you were like you, you could touch it there. My gosh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. So they they fitted it um, to be able to fit the the Saturn V third stage in it and a bunch of other you know Apollo programs to be able to transport them to the Kennedy Space Center a lot quicker. Um, but very cool plane. So. And that's a, a very cool place in general too. I mean, Palmdale, I was, uh, I'm like super jealous that you got in there. I got to say, cause I was actually at Palmdale, like visiting Los Angeles a few months before you went out there and actually went to that same spot, but there's like this giant fence there, right? Because it's actually inside, uh, where they developed the SR 71, right? This is like a, uh, the home of like Lockheed Martin skunk works at one time. Yep. And, and they- uh, it's split up, yeah. So it's it's kind of like the big fenced area, and then they have the the museum part of it, and then they right. have you know, Armstrong, and then um, all the different you know Air Force Base time. Yeah, but I remember like yeah, I went to the museum there, and like they have some really cool stuff there. Like they they have an A twelve, like mm-hmm. that's what they named Elon Musk's kid after, right? The A twelve. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> and and uh, they had like this weird like drone there as well that I never knew existed. It was like you know uh, an engine to sell from a SR seventy one that was like a self drive flying thing like I didn't had no idea they had that in the 60s but I was there like like peering over the fence saying looking at the NASA building saying oh I wish I could go in there and, and a few months later you go in there <laughs> so it's funny the, the directions that they gave us were to a building number mm-hmm. and when I got there because I rented a car and I went there and I was like I have no idea where I am and all you see is these fences with like you know where am I going and there's these yeah obscure hangers with numbers <laughs> found it eventually <laughs> it's awesome i got to imagine though that the more of these that you're going to you've got to probably be making some great uh networking connections and friends that are also going to these and it now it becomes this like awesome science reunion every time you uh, go to another one absolutely yeah so the you know that's kind of how all these things that are you know, tied together is through these connections and you know meeting people have met people that have adopted greyhounds of all things at these NASA circles and you know we've stayed connected through social media and so it's like just being open to all these opportunities and really going for it and really kind of going out there and doing it if it's something that yeah. you're passionate about. That's really what it's about like like let's talk a little bit about what the NASA social program is like you know basically I'll let you talk about it like how did you get into it and uh, what's it all about? Yeah, so the NASA Social Program is, um, it's, it's, there are different events that are hosted and um, depending on the mission that they're, that they're going to be launching or it could be a, a specific event like the, the SOFIA event wasn't a launch, it was uh, taking a tour. And so the idea is to kind of get audiences that aren't traditionally uh, space people to be introduced to the programs that NASA has going on. And so at the end of this, I can put up a, a link to where uh, anybody can apply. And right now there aren't any events going on because of you know, COVID right now, but that hopefully that'll, that'll start back up again because they're incredible when you just apply. And um, you have to have a social media presence either on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Twitch, I mean, anything. And you put in your information and you apply and you wait and then they, they take you if you're a good fit and take it from there. So, it, it really is a brilliant marketing move by NASA. I mean, what a great way to get, you know, the current events and, and their message out to the general public by utilizing space enthusiasts like, like yourself and people all over the country that are so passionate about this and, again, are, are sharing their experiences to the general public. I mean, you, you yourself, I mean, we have a, a membership of, what, a, about 100 Central Florida Astronomical Society members and multiple times you've brought back your experiences to share with just us, let alone all of your other followers. So it's, it really is a smart move by NASA. Um, I'd love to see some of the other space companies, SpaceX, Blue Origin, 
uh, maybe start to pick up on this also. Yeah, I believe that they actually are. I'm not sure of the details. I believe Blue Origin had one of them. Um, and don't quote me on who else, but I believe that they're, that they're starting. They're starting to get that. And so mm -hmm. the SpaceX ones are, are also in uh, collaboration with the NASA socials. And so some of the ones that have done of these have been for SpaceX launches. And so I'll go, I'll come back to this, but um, where is this? Oops. How do I, there we go. All right, so do you see the Cygnus? Yes. yes. Okay. So that was one, um, that was actually Northrop Grumman launch, and so another collaboration with NASA and Northrop Grumman for another resupply uh, mission. And so these are the sounding rockets. We took a tour of the sounding rocket facility um, and how they get the science up quickly using sounding rockets, which are very cool. I did not take a picture for, let me just say that. And uh, <laughs> oh, that would be pretty cool, but I took all the others. <laughs> Picture five is the horizontal integration facility, which they have, and this is at Wallops Flight Facility in Chincoteague, Virginia. And the horizontal integration facility is similar to the vehicle assembly building, only it's a lot smaller and it's the rockets that are assembled horizontally. So inside would be picture six, which is the first stage of an Antares rocket, which was next in line after the one that we saw launch. And so the one that we saw launch was picture seven. And let's see, picture, where is it? It's tucked behind here, picture eight. It's a picture of the satellite uh, dishes, the fields where uh, the satellite dishes were, were all positioned, it was very cool. Yeah. You are getting amazing access through this program. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I can go into more detail if you ever want for anybody I and mean, um, talk forever about them. And this one was a CRS-18, so the commercial resupply uh, system, uh, systems yeah um mission from spacex and nasa and so falcon 9 launch and this one was delayed a few times also <laughs> but that's part of it right and now uh, what's cool is that the part to quit picture two is they do like a, a nasa live um live stream event and so they kind of give you a behind the scenes look of all the science that's on board and one of the things was what picture four is which is the international uh, docking adapter and that's kind of like a scaled down version of what went up. And so this international docking adapter hooks onto, now if you guys can see this, the Harmony module of the International Space Station yeah. is where the Demo-2, the, the last launch, docked to the International Space Station using adapters similar to Picture 4. And so it's neat to kind of follow the progression and seeing you know, the equipment that they're taking and the supplies that they're taking, which are used in future missions so um and then there was a falcon 9 rocket just laying there <laughs> just lying there <laughs> the park one. Yeah. and the, the second to last one that i did was the solar orbiter we got to tour the the ula facilities um and tori bruno in uh picture six the ceo i was pretty jealous of seeing that picture with uh, bruno that was that was pretty cool he was like um tweeting people and messaging people in the in the group to like you know, have him show up or not, and uh, and then he showed up and he gave us the tour of his of his place. So that was pretty awesome. And um, of the space launch system, so the the launch support system, sorry, and that's kind of they they follow the rockets from um, from launch until you know, they kind of follow the trajectory of the of the launch. So this is a solar orbiter launch, um, and that solar orbiter launch was just fantastic. Because if if you go back one slide, and and I think it's image five and uh, seven there, um, I remember this vividly. We we were there with um, uh, Derek was actually on top of the VAB for this one. Uh, took an amazing picture. I, I was uh, down in the grass with uh, Seth Mayo and, and Jason Schreiner from uh, the Daytona Planetarium, but. Describe what people are looking at in picture number five. I mean, what is that bright object up in the sky? This rocket was heading, I mean, it looked like it from our vantage point, right? It was heading right towards a, a was it full moon that night? It did, that was actually, yeah, the, the, the bright spot there is actually the full moon. And so it looked like the rocket was just gonna be going to the moon, which was very cool. And it just kind of, it kept going forever. And in the second picture to the right with the orange trail, that's after separation and that's the booster that would be uh, coming back down and then, um, yeah, not landing in this case, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was incredible. And so you can get some yeah. cool shots of 
when we launch, but separation and all the, the stages. Yeah, that's a launch I, I don't think I'm ever going to forget. The way the way the full moon, well, one, the way the rocket was heading right towards the full moon, and then two, the, the way the moonlight illuminated the contrail. Uh, it was just, your, your picture is pretty close to my memory. I think I have a very similar picture with my camera Ooh, also. Yeah, you guys are standing on just to the left of us. Yeah, so what a, that was a great night. Yeah, yeah, so that was a neat launch, and I've been uh, kind of doing a lot of, a lot more research about the orbiter itself. Uh, it's just a neat, neat uh, launch. And yeah, it's, it's got a couple more years before it gets there, but it's on yeah. its way. So it's a partnership with ESA, European Space Agency. Um, but yeah, and so the last one is Demo 2, which I only have one picture of because I photographed it from my backyard. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's probably the one that I'll speak the least about because people are most fluent with it, but you know, I'm sure it'll come up again in the future and uh, yeah, with the importance of it, of course. So uh, to be part of the Solar System Ambassador Program, the applications open on September 1st, September 1st, August 1st. August 1st or September 1st, don't quote me on that, but they're open for a month and um, this is the mission. It's a, it's a program that works with volunteers from across the nation and sharing different kinds of, you know, science that NASA is doing and um, the discoveries and, and, you know, reaching as many people as we can to, to share our love about it. So um, to get involved with the Solar System Ambassador Program, that's the first website um, and then and I can post the links in, in the comments or something later on and then for the socials it's the second one and then how to reach me personally if you want through Instagram or my website. So that's cool. cool. Excellent. Well we had a question in the chat. Um, Gilbert asked what do rocket launches smell like up close? Did you ever get a distinct smell from the rockets? Yeah. Um, from when we were there, I don't know. It, it doesn't really smell like anything, actually. <laughs> in in the in the launches itself, we're not close enough. Where we're you know you, you're hopefully not that close. But then if you're in the the factories, I mean, a lot of these factories are very clean and um, it, they're just machine shops. So you, you could you know smell the oils, the machine oils, the airplane oils, um, but nothing nothing too distinctive, actually. Yeah, there. I think a lot of times you're uh, you're so focused on the visual first, right? You're watching this giant machine uh, leave Earth's gravity, so you're that that number one sense is is just completely overcome. And then two, the sound, right? The sound, that rumble, that distinctive rumble that slowly starts to build and build after the rocket is uh, has has begun its climb. And uh, I guess a you know, based on where we're watching launches, usually it's it's kind of this marshy, murky. We, sure. you know, they launch it from a swamp, right? So it kind of smells like frogs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I heard I've heard people describe it as, uh, you know, you go and and feel the launch. It's like a, a concussion in your whole body. Just if you're close enough to to split, you know, like the the solar orbiter, for example, and the Falcon Heavies, that it just it's just incredible. I mean, it's life-changing when you're when you're there so awesome. but i'll have to pay attention to the smell of never, never yeah i guess it depends on what fuel they're burning right i mean a lot of it's just like yeah. you know, stuff that wouldn't smell i wouldn't think you know liquid oxygen and yeah, <laughs> hydrogen, it but, pretty quick too yeah. so yeah cool so like what's the difference between the solar system ambassador program and the national the uh, nasa social program like is there overlap there are they two totally different things <laughs> Yeah, there can be. So the Solar System Ambassador is the program that you apply for, and then it's a year-long uh, commitment, and you do at least four events a year, and they're just outreach events. Um, anybody can apply, and it's, it's they kind of go through and they have references and whatnot. And so then, when you're selected, then um, you can get different webinars. They have, uh, I think it's like a couple of months that they do with different experts on you know different programs. So they'll have like the Mars. Mars rovers. Um, they'll do trainings on how to how to talk about, for example, the Mars launch that's coming up, um, hopefully in July. And yeah, they'll do a, just different trainings. And so it's more educational in that regard. And then you kind of take that information and present it on your own in your own way to the public. The NASA socials are if you have a social media presence and you can kind of relay that information 
in either live time or kind of put together a presentation and present it later on, um, but kind of just giving updates from in social media. And so anybody can apply to either one and you know, there's selection process for both and there you go. So. But yeah, that's what's awesome. Like I remember seeing that Facebook post like a few years ago from NASA saying, hey, we're opening up the NASA social program. If you want to apply, here's the form. And the difference between you and me is that you did it. <laughs> and you've done all this cool stuff as a result. So I think there's a, there's a lesson there for people somewhere. You know, if, if opportunity comes knocking, don't be afraid to go after it. Um, no, and I'll even add, you know, I mean, I haven't been selected for every single one and I've been put on wait lists for, for a few of them. So, yeah. you know, demo one, I was on a wait list and then I got added in and and it started this whole thing so here i am you know so definitely apply and um, don't give up yep and you get a cool jacket as part of the uh, solar system ambassador deal right (laughs) added to my jacket because i want to be cool (laughs) cool (laughs) even better and you said there is a a a social for or ambassador program for uh, i guess social and ambassador or for perseverance or do we know? There will be, I don't know if there'll be an event, a social event, like for the demo two, the, the social was virtual. So there were like 20,000 people that were on, on that Facebook group. But it was, it was a lot of fun. You know, usually the, the socials are anywhere from like 30 to hundred people that are selected uh, depending on the, on the launch. But for solar system ambassadors, we'll be getting kind of the, the insiders look as to what's going on to then be able to, to relay that information to everybody. But that's do cool. it. Yeah. Do any of the solar system ambassador programs involve any launches that are outside of the United States of America? For example, uh, you know, you, we've got James Webb Space Telescope. It got delayed again, of course, because of COVID-19. But is, is that even a, a on the table for something like this? Or is it mostly launches that happen uh, and events that happen here in North America? It's a- and because, it, for example, like ESA, the solar orbiter, that it was ESA, and it was kind of a lot of uh, Euro- the European countries came here to participate in the launch. I believe right now it's just in the U.S. Don't quote me on that. Um, there might be other ones in, like, with JAXA or with ESA in, you know, in Europe or Japan or whatever in, like, their own um, thing. And I think there actually are ESA events, ESA social events for Europe. They're not affiliated with NASA. And again, don't quote me on that, but... Sure. believe that they're separate. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of funny. You know, we, we often talk about the uh, the overview effect, right? You know, that if you're really into space and like you can see the earth from space or even imagine that, you know, you stop thinking about these national boundaries so much like we're just humans, right? Uh, so, you know, ideally, you know, we'd be thinking about all these space programs holistically. But hey, you know, money has to come from somewhere. So I get it. <laughs> It's interesting. It's just the perspective shift that I that I keep hearing about from you know from astronauts and from that have seen that and, um, and have experienced that. And that's I think what what's appealing as a therapist is to you know kind of have that connection with people through space. And you know that, that's just incredible to, to make that um, to make that jump. So yeah, I was hoping you'd go there because that's kind of a good segue to the Blue Marble Project, right? Where you sort of like exploring that intersection between mental wellness and space, which I never really ever would have thought that was a thing. But uh, yeah. the overview effect is an example of that, right? Absolutely, and um, that's something that I'd like to like to talk more about in a in a post. And um, so, Blue Marble Project is just kind of a, a hybrid website that I've that I've put together where I talk about different um, different situations. So, like communication, that's something that we always need to work on on earth right and so how can we learn from space what can we learn from the international space station from space flight that that they have learned and they have improved that we can then apply to us on earth what are things that with perspective shift with with overview effects with all these you know different uh, existential things that we can kind of learn from that and using space as a way to bring it back and improve our wellness on earth Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah Yeah, and uh, if people well, I'll see that it's uh, the blue marble project.com, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the website. And uh, yeah, the blue marble project.com. And uh, haven't posted in, in a little bit, uh, but I'll do just like a recap video of, of either a launch or an event with a topic and then uh, just like research based reasons of why this is important um, and how the thing relate. So, right, cool. And to recap, people can follow uh, you and Anubis at uh, Anubis the Great on Instagram, right? Yes, it is Anubis the Great. Where do I have it? Yeah, it's, I can. I'll put it in the 
in the chat. So on Instagram, at Anubis underscore the date. Oh, and he's actually, well, it linked to the Facebook page, but oh. we're, we're same yeah. thing. They're owned by the same company. <laughs> but yeah, that's another like great jujitsu move. There he is. Yeah. It's like, you know, people come for the cute dog and like they get, they get space. So <laughs> awesome. Cool. Um, where else Hold can on they on find me. you? Uh, Koi Counseling is your counseling business as well, right? So yeah, that's my private practice. So Koi Counseling. Um, and I don't counsel Koi Fish. Counsel people. Oh, yeah. They don't need it. They're, they're pretty, they're pretty chill. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you for that, uh, for all that stuff. It's really inspiring stuff. And um, gosh, yeah, I, you've seen some amazing stuff. And it, it's a good reminder for all of us of just, you know, how much exciting stuff is happening in the midst of a otherwise challenging year. There's still a lot of like really great progress that humanity is making. Uh, we're exploring space, you know, both robotically and with human beings. Hey, I mean, remember there's uh, those two guys that launched, they're still up there, people, you know, they're, they're, they're on the space station for a while and they still have to get back down. So uh, it's not over yet, guys. It's, uh, and there's a cool spaceship up there too. So it's easy to forget, you know, some of the positive things that are happening, uh, but they are. And thank you for playing the role of reminding us of all that. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's such a, such a cool time to be involved in, in space and science. We've got uh, all these amazing uh, spacecraft going up into space, all these new discoveries, which kind of is a good segue. Uh, you know, Gilbert had another great question I'll pose to the two of you is, if you could build your own mission, limited to our solar system, what would it be? Where would you want to go? Sharifa? I think I'd actually pick the moon for right now. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'd want to hang out on the moon for a while and, and see what see what can come from that you know really start to explore um instead of just seeing if we can do it as, as humanity but seeing how we can thrive on there so not just survive but thrive and you know, it seems and of course every other planet but you know i'll stick with the moon. that's pretty exciting that uh the announcement what was that yesterday the viper mission uh uh astrobotics is going to be sending a rover to the moon in 2023 and it's going to explore the southern pole of the moon a place that no one has ever been before and where we know that there is water ice that can be harvested uh, not only for for humans but to, for rocket fuel to turn the moon into a gateway to other parts of our solar system so now we have a kind of a gas station on our way to uh, to all these other cool places Frank, where, where are you going? Where's your, what's your mission? Oh, I would send a robot somewhere, first of all, because I'm too chicken to go into space myself. It's, uh, space is not a friendly place. Like, it really wants to kill you. But um, for people who are adventurous enough to go out there, more power to you. I'm cheering you on. Uh, but I would send a robot to Europa, I think, uh, because, you know, I want to know what's underneath the ice there. You know, if there's, a, if there's a spot in the solar system where life may have emerged independently, it's a pretty good candidate. So that's what I want to find out. Are we alone? Nice. How about you, Justin? Where would you go? Oh, let me think here real quick. All right. So, I mean, we, we just got these spectacular views of Pluto in 2015. New Horizons gave us, what, more science that uh, in, what, just in one flyby than we'd had in, in, since 1930 when we discovered it. Um, so not Pluto, Uranus, it's got the funny name, it gets picked on all the time, but I got to go with Neptune. I mean, Neptune, we haven't been back there since 1989 when Voyager 2 flew past it. There's not, we don't know that much about it. And one of the cool things about Neptune is it was, th this planet was discovered using mathematics. You know, you've got, uh, uh, um, Isaac Newton's laws of gravity, and we had discovered uh, Uranus, and we, we knew that Uranus wasn't behaving the way it should based on the laws of gravity. Uh, astronomers knew that something was kind of tugging on it, and the mathematicians went and did some work, and they said, you know what, based on the math and the laws of gravity, uh, if you point your telescopes maybe right over there in the sky, there should be a planet there. And the astronomers pointed their telescope there and they discovered Neptune. I mean, how awesome is that? And then you've got this planet 
with the highest wind speeds ever recorded over a thousand miles per hour. I mean, you think about the most powerful hurricane on earth has wind gusts of 180 miles an hour, category five storm. This has a thousand mile per hour winds and the pressure on Neptune is so intense that the carbon atoms get crushed down into diamonds and it rains diamonds on this on this planet. So I'm going to Neptune. I'm going to grab some diamonds and get back to Earth and uh, and uh, just retire a, a wealthy old man. <laughs> That's like one space mission that might actually pay for itself. So oh, there yeah. you go. See, yeah. right, the ROI is there. We already we, see. We're going. We're going. To <laughs> That's true, though. <laughs> Yeah, like when Voyager well, went by, we only saw like half of the planet too, right? Like it just kind of like zipped yeah. past it and like, uh, uh, right. Right. So there's, there's, there's a whole lot we don't know about that planet. You're absolutely right. What an right. amazing mission though. That the, 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 uh, you know, uh, you've got this gentleman at NASA who figures out the math to say that every 175 years, we have one shot of uh, visiting all the outer planets using a slingshot method around Jupiter, around Saturn, around Uranus, around Neptune, be able to get one spacecraft to visit all four of these planets. Only happens every 175 years. And they always made the joke that uh, Thomas Jefferson had a chance to do this and he blew it. So uh, they, they couldn't pass up this opportunity. Yep, yep. And uh, likewise, we have an opportunity to visit Mars again soon. And that's uh, hopefully happening real soon now. Uh, yeah, July 17th, 9 a.m. Mark your calendars. Uh, if you live in the Florida area, we'll go to this launch. Uh, don't you do, don't want to miss this. You've got a rover going to Mars with a drone helicopter, friend transformer uh, with it that is going to be uh, surveying the Martian landscape, looking for these uh, amazing places to dig. So uh, July 17th, 9 a.m. Uh, Sharifa, you going, you going to this launch? You going to get some pictures? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. I didn't pick my spot yet, but oh, yeah. Okay. Atlas V, that'll be, and that's a nice, big, beautiful rocket. So, uh, Frank, we got to get you out to some of these launches. Have you, you got one, a memorable one? Oh, probably the most memorable one was the uh, Falcon Heavy initial launch for me. Yeah, that was that was tough to beat. But actually, one of my first memories as a kid was watching Voyager 1 launch from the roof of my house in Brevard County when I was a wee little tyke. So uh, that's kind of what okay. kicked that all off That's pretty me. cool. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty cool. But uh, Vo uh, Falcon Heavy was tough to beat. That was, that was a pretty cool launch. Very, very festive. And um, I don't know, there's just so much energy there. I think you were both there for that one, weren't you? Yeah, I was there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The last two, yeah, the last two Falcon Heavies, and um, one of them, the one from the beach uh, that I was there, it was for, oh God, I can't remember the, what they were going up for, but then there was another one that, um, that I saw by the causeway that was there. Yeah, the, for the first one was basically just what, uh, uh, the Tesla Roadster with Starman in it. Yes. And then yes. the second one had, what, three or four payloads in it, and I mean, how cool yeah. was that? They went from this, this, uh, you know, rock star in a roadster going to Mars. And then all of a sudden from that, they were ready to start, you know, putting billion dollar uh, uh, NASA projects into space. Mm -hmm. I wonder how Starman is doing. He's yeah. got to be close to Mars by now, I would think. Should uh, should check up on him. There, there's like a website where you can track where he is. So oh, we should go find out. But that was like what was so cool about this, just the ridiculousness of the entire thing. You know, like you're seeing this like massive rocket, like taking off and like hitting you. It's more power than you've you know, like felt since the space shuttle. And then, you know, you see this ridiculous Tesla Roadster with a dummy in it pop out of the nose. Oh, it was just. No. And, and I, as much as I wanted to watch it, get as close as I could to the first uh, Falcon Heavy rocket itself, because this thing is so massive, I chose ultimately to go down to Cocoa Beach, which was the closest spot to landing zone one, where both of the boosters came down simultaneously, right? Normally on a Falcon 9, we just see the one booster, but to watch these come down 
you know, we, we had our, uh, I just, I still get chills thinking about it. Yeah. It, it was like watching uh, something out of a, like a Superman movie. It looked like a, you know, Superman coming back down to earth um, and landing at the same time. And then multiple sonic booms hitting yes. you. It was the coolest day. I, 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 yeah, I mean, honestly, I can't think of a launch that is uh, more incredible than that day. Yeah, it was awesome. I just left you with this, like, you know, sense of hope for humanity, you know, like, wow, we could do some cool stuff. And it actually worked like, I, it, wow. <laughs> Plus, you know, those sonic booms, like that, that gets you right in the feels, right? Because I don't know, like, I, I miss the space shuttle ones, you know, what can I say? It was good to feel that again. <laughs> hey, did you guys feel the boom from the uh, CRS-2 launch? When? Yeah, the... Uh, for two, I yeah. I didn't from where I was. I was about um, I was about thirty miles away in a in a kind of an open field, and um, I don't know if the, it was the way the winds were going, but I didn't get it. Um, how about you? Yeah, we did. Um, you know, we uh, assume it was probably from the the uh, first stage re-entering, right? But uh, yeah, we actually uh, felt it hit our house here in Winter Springs, so we wow. got lucky. We we're just like in the right place at the right time. Man, I must not have noticed. That's something yeah. that I wanted to really see the boosters land like that. Oh God, to see them or even one. I mean, just, just to see them come down. Oh my mm -hmm. goodness. Well, lately they've been landing at sea more often than not, it seems. Yeah. But, uh, uh, or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you only really have what three options if depending on the weight of the payload, if it's a light payload, they can land back on the Cape. If it's a heavier payload, it lands out on the drone ship, which is just amazing that they can even do that. Now they're catching fairings. Mm -hmm. off off of this thing which i still don't understand the physics of how that they do that the engineering there and then three which happens very rarely if it's an incredibly heavy payload then uh, the whole booster is jettisoned into the atlantic ocean but that doesn't happen too often with spacex All right cool well i think we're at the hour mark here so uh justin do we have any last questions that we want to hit before we sign off uh, let's see here. Let me scan down here. Um, no, we're looking pretty good. Everyone seemed to be enjoying the show. I thank everyone for tuning in and uh, spending an hour with us tonight. And uh, uh, we will be back again uh, next Thursday. We have an amazing show from some of our planetarium uh, friends in Hawaii. So tune in on Thursday at seven o'clock. For that event that's going to be really cool we're going to be talking about some of those telescopes on mauna kea and then uh, next friday we'll be back again uh, 10 o'clock uh, or, or no we're not actually we have no show friday because the 20th uh, saturday morning yeah we're back yes. with the smithsonian we actually they liked us enough they invited us back and um uh, derek is going to be running his solar telescope we're going to actually be doing a morning show uh, on June 20th, Saturday, June 20th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, uh, looking at the sun, the entire program will be about the closest star to Earth, our, our star, the sun, and uh, looking at solar prominences, uh, hopefully looking at some sunspots, uh, just talking about uh, uh, how magnificent our, our, our own star is and looking at it up close, looking at the photosphere, looking at the corona um, of, our, of our star. So tune in for, for both of those events. Those are going to be a lot of fun. And then uh, we'll maybe see you back here in two weeks for uh, another, hopefully clear skies will be with us. And if not, Frank, you'll just continue to show us some of these amazing pictures you keep taking with uh, Scopey McScope based. <laughs> And maybe by then we'll have a better name for them. <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> I don't know. T tell us in the in the chat if you think Scopey McScope Scope Face should remain, or uh, if you've got a cool name, uh, throw in the chat. And maybe Frank will consider it. But it's his Absolutely. baby. I don't know. I don't know if you want to change that. It's a good name. It's a, it's a good name. <laughs> have you named your telescope yet, Sharika? I haven't. So because it's a loner from from Cephas. Ah, that's true. Yes. Yes. I just call him uh, Space Cannon because it looks like a cannon <laughs> points to space. But now yeah. nothing, nothing like scoping scope face. I mean, that's <laughs> Oh, gosh. All right. Well, yeah, I guess we're done here. Uh, so, yeah, we'll um, see you guys on the 20th at 1030 for the solar show. And uh, thank you again to Sharifa for joining us tonight. It was, uh, it was a blast. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.
stopping the live stream.